Hey everybody, how's it going? Let me know if you can hear me. Hear me, okay? We'll give everybody a couple more minutes because uh, we said we we're going to start at six thirty my time, and so a couple more minutes before we get going. Free to say hi in the chat. Okay. Make sure I got everything handled. Let's go ahead and close you. All right, gotta grab a soda, and then we'll uh, get things started. <sighs> All right, so. Um, Oh boy, we're gonna do a mad science project around decentralized social media, something which I can never really seem to get away from. <laughs> um, is you might know, uh, you might know that you know we worked on something around this space. We worked on a peer-to-peer -peer social network for a lot of last year and walked away from it uh, because we felt like we didn't have everything figured out. That's something I've been talking about recently. I uh, Put up a blog post about it today talking about how we needed to have questions answered around moderation and how things like that'll work and um there were some other challenges that came along with it when we were playing with it in the past we weren't 100 percent satisfied with how the technology worked um and uh I'm just realizing my door is open so my whole all my apartment neighbors are hearing me so i'm gonna have to close that one second So yeah, we had some technical challenges. It's a little bit quiet. Let me try boosting it real quick here. All right, let me know how that is. So we had some technical challenges. Um, and you know, there are things like, uh, we were building it in a kind of a purely peer-to-peer -peer fashion with Beaker, which uh, worked good, except that uh, we had um, no answer for people that didn't download Beaker to be able to use the thing. So. We were a little bit limited by the state of adoption of the HyperCore protocol to build a peer-to-peer -peer network. And we had some challenges that sort of revealed themselves as we were developing things around how to handle schemas uh, and deal with schema agreement as people were building new applications it became a pretty big challenge. Uh, but then, of course, everything regarding moderation in terms of how uh, who has control to remove somebody from a server or anything along those lines or to remove a piece of content. And that started to become pretty clearly a problem because we had begun to realize, well, you know, if you're doing a social network thing, you need notifications and you need to be able to get, uh, you know, when somebody follows you or whenever uh, somebody replies to you. And sometimes you even want to see posts by people that you haven't followed yet, but they're like your extended network or something. And so we had started to put together a sort of an aggregator to do that and started to realize, well, we don't really know how, we don't have a story around where that's going to go in the future. And so we sort of have put down the project and sat around thinking about it quite a bit. And our thoughts sort of evolved into what I was sharing on the blog post today, which I might as well share in the chat here because this is a nice set of ideas that's going to be kind of behind what we're doing. Um, and so let me grab the link real quick and dump it in the chat. So we're calling this the the title we gave for this blog post is the anti parlor, the anti parlor because we uh, in the situation that we're in with what's been going on lately with like parlor and and Trump getting removed from the internet, you know people are thinking about decentralization and the thing that I want to make clear is that 
you know, the having a whole lot of power put into those companies, that's not a great thing. But at the same time, it's not about creating a, an anything goes situation where moderation doesn't exist. Um, the, the point is to actually have moderation that works better for people. And so, um, and in fact, the, how you address making it work better for people is the interesting challenge. You got to think about, you know, how do you make sure that people that have moderation and ability don't abuse their authority? Um, how do you make sure that, um, there are certain things they actually can't do? Like, uh, maybe they, everybody ought to always have the ability to just take their data and walk away from a service. Um, and maybe if they're going to ban somebody from a, a, a community, there has to be a process for it that they can't, you know, circumvent. Uh, there's really no simple answers around it so much as just understanding the, the framework of thinking here. That if we're going to be giving authority to people, we should have some uh, solutions in place to kind of constrain their authority. Uh, so... Given that we have a fair amount of code left over from when we were working on the social network idea that was purely peer-to-peer, -peer, um, and we have some ideas about how to go at some of the unsolved questions we had earlier, it seemed like, you know what, I've got some time right now to try out different projects, and I thought, I'm going to pick that code back up, and I'm going to try to fix some of the problems we had before, and I'm also going to try to do this in a way that it's moving really quickly, that uh, we have, like, uh, quick MVPs that it's about um, uh, developing it in the open like this, um, and um, and really uh, in many ways just building for fun. Uh, I'm 100% calling this a mad science experiment. Um, so it's 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 meant to be something which is following my you know just kind of where my uh, uh, my interests take me and, and where y'all's interests take us as I you know do this on streams and things and y'all tell me what you think. Um, and it's still early. There's going to be a lot of designing that we're doing, uh, right here tonight. So, uh, hopefully by the end of the night, we'll have some beginnings of the, the design. Um, and per perhaps even a kind of a first piece of work in code. We'll see how long we go. So here's kind of where I'm at with it. Uh, it's going to be a Twitter style kind of uh, blogging, micro blogging thing. Uh, you're going to have threaded replies and media embeds in the posts. I'm thinking we're going to do social following and social block lists. I was thinking about whether or not to do uh, following people or to have it be um, just kind of like uh, topics or you know groups or rooms. You know, um, I'm kind of leaning towards the following as opposed to uh, 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 spaces, um, and uh, that is in part because if you look over on the tech side, it's going to be a, a hybrid of peer-to-peer -peer federation at the outset. That's the plan. And we'll talk about what that, how that works, but it sort of means that a given node will be uh, a federation node, uh, one of the servers, that is, uh, will end up being its own kind of forum. And if it's working correctly, in the ideal form, you would be able to have an identity which spans multiple of these different federated nodes. But we'll get into, we'll dig into that in a second. Uh, so, you know, also have notifications and basic search for, for users and for content. So those are the kind of feet, the MVP features I'm aiming for. Just a real simple Twitter clone to start. Um, thinking we're going to have likes, thinking we're going to have the equivalent of retweets. Uh, it's going to be a Node.js application, peer-to-peer -peer and federated um, uh, hybrid architecture using the HyperCore protocol. And we're going to try to give it a pretty generic API for applications. We'll see exactly how generic it gets. Uh, it depends on how we, we go at this thing. So here's a little diagram of what a peer-to-peer -peer and federation hybrid will look like. Between the different servers, we're going to have the HyperCore protocol being responsible for synchronizing the data between them. So any kind of database that any of these servers maintains will more or less, if it's a public database, be exposed on the HyperCore protocol so that you can um, synchronize information from somebody else's node as you need it. And the... Uh, there's actually two interesting benefits of having the data get stored on, in HyperCore. One of them is the federation aspect of it, but the other is the idea of being able to fork the, the server. Um, and this kind of gets on an idea I've talked about where you talk about the servers as being fungible, where it, you could t take all the data out of a given server um, and um, sort of replicate it to a new node, run the same code, and you'd have a perfect copy of the server. Um, the only thing you wouldn't be able to copy over from one other server is the private keys. Um, so the idea of being able to kind of fork communities in that way is a pretty interesting idea. And it's even interesting to think 
what if we sort of were able to bake in an automated utility for that where you could um, if you were so inclined spin up the command line you know the CLI for for the application on some VPS VPS somewhere uh, point it at an existing node and say go ahead and clone that thing use the same hypercores and then do a, you know replace a couple of the sort of authority uh, uh, configuration so that this is a space that I'm going to be moderating so you could just actually built in the forking pr uh, process so Ilya is asking what does the federation model give you is it similar to Mastodon so it'll, it'll, it'll start to become clear exactly uh, how this uh, is similar and how it's different to Mastodon as I kind of go through the architecture here but <clears throat> The main thing the federated model uh, gives us is really two things. The first is giving us a nice gateway to the existing web. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how Beaker will factor into this, but by and large, having it work on the existing web is a nice benefit because then people can um, uh, access it using the browsers they already use. Helps kind of avoid any kneecapping on adoption that you know we are commonly dealing with with this kind of work. And, you know, sometimes somebody posts something interesting on one of these social networks, and you want to be able to share it with people in a convenient way. It's really nice to be able to have a web link, you know, a web com broadly compatible web link like that. So that's value number one, is just compatibility with the existing web platform. Uh, the number two is, um, it is a good plus. All right, the number two. I had a number two in there. Um, oh, boy, what was my other... Positive. Oh, yes. Um, no matter how you design uh, an application in a peer-to-peer -peer system, you're going to end up needing computing resources. Uh, in fact, kind of once you, a peer-to-peer -peer system, the interesting thing about it is the degree of sort of uh, freedom it's meant to give you in terms of like um, disconnecting the authority from the executing nodes, right? So that, um, for instance, you have the possibility of running a whole lot of the applications that normally get run entirely on a server can start to run entirely on your device, right? But then the question becomes, okay, I, I want to be able to search a, a ton of, uh, of people's posts or search for a ton of, you know, through a big database of, of users or just even have access to a nice big cache of people's posts. Or I want to have my stuff be online all the time. You know, that's a resource in and of itself, keeping a device online and hosting with the bandwidth. So inevitably you get a need to have larger nodes in the system. Now in an ideal version of this, my personal preference would be that everybody sort of chooses their, uh, can turn off this guy. Uh, everybody getting, um, everybody was, kind of has a bring your own super node kind of situation where um, that is completely detached from the software. But for a sort of an MVP approach is kind of a simpler solution to just have the federated nodes acting as those aggregators, pulling from the peer-to-peer -peer network and providing the kind of beefier resources for maintaining, uh, you know, aggregated indexes and things like that. Now we got the, I was talked about how it's a benefit to be using Hypercore to synchronize between the servers. You know, one of the nice things compared, like one of the challenges with ActivityPub is that the wire protocol has application semantics in it. So when you see, when you look at how it's designed, it's not bad. I'm not criticizing heavily, but it's it's um, it's not really a database replication protocol. It's a social media replication protocol. Hypercore is a database replication protocol. It's completely agnostic about the kind of data in there, which hopefully means that it's going to be a stable uh, underlying thing. And then the application, you know, database models. The schemas, uh, things like that, can kind of evolve independently of how Hypercore works, which means that you should be able to uh, avoid having to go through um, more, like it should be less challenging to upgrade the applications over time because you're not going to end up having wire protocol disagreements uh, because that remains stable separately from, excuse me, separately from the application's development. Um, so... The other interesting thing about this is there's really going to be two possibilities for how users are interacting with these federated nodes. One of them is um, that the, the node would actually act as the, um, I guess you might call it guardian or uh, maintainer. There's a term that's been used for this recently. 
Um, but the the custodian of your all of your hypercore data, meaning that they would hold on to the private key for you. And so if you're using like a regular web browser, that would be what happens. You go to the uh, to the federated node, you create an account, and it just says, okay, we'll create that hypercore for you, we'll hold on to it. But another interesting option that we can have is if you have a uh, hypercore protocol enabled web browser like Beaker, you could actually create the data set yourself on your own device and then just tell the public key to the server, say, hey, this is my database here. And so then any writes that you make, any kind of um, you know posts you make or anything like that, you do locally and then you sync up to the server. So then you're actually able to literally own your data while still interacting with the federated node. And if we architect this correctly, that should lead to a situation where you could pick up your data and move to a different federation node without any challenges. So you have um, that kind of uh, right of exit, the right to walk away and, and, and move to a new node if you wanted to. And so it also sort of lends to the possibility that you don't even use a federated node, that you actually participate sort of independently in the thing. Uh, but that sort of depends on how this will all shake out over time. <laughs> so there are three kinds of databases, at least, that we're going to have in this system. First of all, every user is going to have their own Hyper-B database. Hyper-Bs are a key value, a peer-to-peer -peer key value database, sort of like LevelDB. Uh, so that is what we're, every user is going to be, have their own Hyper-B. It's going to have their profile information. It'll have their avatar, all their social follows, all their posts and replies, all their likes any embedded media that they post, that'll all go inside of their Hyper-B database. And so uh, a given user will internally have the public key of their, of their database acting as their sort of internal identifier. Um, and whenever you are syncing any individual user's data, because like maybe you're following it, uh, that's the, the database you'd look at. And so if I'm actually following somebody that's on somebody else's node, it would actually internally be subscribing to their Hyper-B data set and pulling that off the peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, and then the server database is, um, so th th this is a public database, meaning that it's only public information. The server has a, a database of its own, which is also public. It's going to include the user registry, which is all of the usernames and how they map to a public key and then any kind of additional information like roles that the users might have on that node, say this is an admin or they have moderator privileges or things like that, that'll be something which perhaps evolves over time. And then I think we're gonna put aggregated indexes in this database as well. <coughs> so that'll be um, all, for all of the users on the node, what are their like counts, what are their follower counts, um, perhaps even computing things like the uh, pre-computing the threads so that you can really quickly load up the threads, perhaps pre-aggregating uh, all of the posts into a fire hose, and then it kind of depends on how we architect that. And it might even go into the sort of inverted uh, the, uh, sort of word search uh, indexes as well to, to be running searches against. We'll feel that out. Um, So I've got somebody in the chat here saying, uh, right now the organization they're working with is using a blockchain to store social media posts, but it doesn't work really well for scalability and onboarding new users. That's always a challenge with this kind of tech. Um, they say, we're in the process of looking at building a system similar to what you're describing. However, we'll be using a DHT instead of activity pub sub for indexing posts. Yeah, makes sense. We use a DHT to look up peers, so to arrange connections between devices. At the, at the moment, that's about all we use it for. Um, all right, so we got two databases there. The, every individual user has their own public database. You got the server has its public database. And then the server has a private database. This is one that won't get shared over the network. It contains any kind of sensitive information that you really don't want to be broadcasting to the world. This would be things like um, any kind of user config that you want to keep private, like their email addresses, Perhaps even if we have uh, like uh, uh, the ability to mute other users, you don't want that to be public. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll keep that in this private database on the server node. Um, something like, you know, who you've muted, it would actually make more sense in an ideal world that that would be stored in a user database instead of a server database. So my list of mutes, you know, I want to be able to take that with me wherever I go. 
The problem is that unless everybody has Beaker and that's how they're using this thing, they actually don't have access to a private database. So for now, we're going to have to compromise and say that the server is going to maintain some, some, some private data on behalf of users. Hopefully the mute list won't be too sensitive of a, of a thing to have there, but that's just how we're going to roll with it right now. Okay. Um, one other note about all this is how we're going to approach schemas. This is something that uh, I've, schema design in a decentralized context is something I've worked on a lot ever since I started on Secure Scuttlebutt. Um, I like to talk about how I have... Um, I'm probably the, the only person that's managed to make, uh, uh, well, m maybe not the only person, but I managed to make the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the JSON LD and RDF people mad at me. I've managed to make the uh, uh, micro pub people mad at me, the micro formats. Uh, I managed to hack them all off. <laughs> and that is because I just have uh, never really been satisfied by anything, and I continue to, to ask questions about, you know, well, is that really the best way to do this? When we worked on uh, Beaker peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer social network in last year, we decided to try to do this kind of YOLO thing where users' data was being stored inside of uh, hyperdrives, which are basically like peer-to-peer -peer file systems or file archives, kind of like a, a torrent. And we were using the path of the files to identify what they were. So if you had a, a microblog post, it would be under slash feed slash you know uh, some file name and then like dot md um, and that worked okay actually except that truth be told while it does work it doesn't really uh, handle some of the hard parts here and what i ultimately have come to conclude is that schema agreement in a decentralized context is a uh um big C challenge, like a, it is a, a notable piece that has to be designed. It's a natural inclination, I think, for people to say, eh, don't worry about it. Let programmers figure it out. You don't need to be paternalistic about it. You know, just let them have any schema they like. Problem is that in a decentralized context, you really need some help. Um, similar to like needing to have, uh, it's kind of like the argument about how you need to have types to help you not make bugs. It's even worse in this context because there are subtle bugs that can emerge as you try to extend people's existing schemas, which are hard to predict. And then once you understand how they exist, knowing how to avoid those bugs becomes even harder. Uh, it's things like uh, one of the things that we did in um, Secure Scuttlebutt was at one point I added a ability to make a, a sort of a microblog post inside of a topic, like a subtopic. And the idea was that It'd be kind of like a subreddit. If you post to that uh, topic, that post would be out of the main feed. It would be in some separate area. And so we handled that by adding a topic field to the posts. And you know, if uh, you, your computer sees a post that's not that has a topic set, and you're looking at the main feed, it won't show that post. It just belongs in a separate space. Problem was that anybody's client that didn't have any understanding of that topic field would just ignore it. And so if somebody decided to open up the cat pics topic and dump 100 cat pics in there, that might actually make sense for what they're experiencing. But anybody that doesn't support the topic field, their main feed would suddenly get blasted with hundreds of cat pics and no idea why. And it seems like their friend has suddenly lost their mind and isn't respecting the public feed space. And that's the kind of subtlety of schema disagreements that, you know, ostensibly it's not even a bug, really, but it creates confusion for users. And so the way that I'm going to approach this is taking the exact opposite approach of what I did before. Instead of doing kind of a laissez-faire schema design, we're doing machine-readable schemas, which will be some combination of JSON schema and some additional information, depending on what we need. They will be published at a URL and should be fetchable. And then the server, after fetching those schemas, will enforce those schemas. So the data uh, sets are going to be identified by those schemas, by those URLs, and strictly enforced uh, on the server. Uh, and so uh, that will be how that will be solved. Now, anybody can create a new schema at any time. You publish the machine-readable uh, schema up somewhere on the, uh, on the internet, give it a URL so that it can be fetched. The system is going to have to fetch it uh, so that it can handle it. Uh, and that's how we're going to solve that. Okay, so that's all for the slides section. 
Well, let's like jump to some Coda figure, right? Does anybody have any questions about anything I talked about there? Feel free to let me know if you do. So I'm going to call the underlying code, the underlying sort of pieces of this citizen. Uh, this seems like a fun name, but I've taken out all the vowels so I can actually get a hold of a domain name because I need to be able to put my schemas underneath a URL. So I'm going to need, you know, the equivalent of ctzn.com or something like that to be publishing those schemas. So citizen is going to be the underlying schemas and everything like that. And then I'll probably make a note, I'm leaning towards something mad science themed. You know, something a little fun, a little light, I invite my friends on to and, and that kind of thing. So let's initialize our, our, our uh, repo here. A decentralized, uh, let's do a hybrid P2P federated social network mad science experiment. No get repo yet. P2P, hypercore, federated. Uh, Paul Frazy, MIT license. Looks good. Let's install some stuff. We need the hyperspace module. We'll need hyper B. And that'll probably be it at first. I think I'm going to use Express to do the HTTP. It's uh, always a good choice, I feel like. I've never really done me wrong. And I'm familiar with it, so that's all good reasons. We'll install Express. And I'm going to need some documentation, so let's get the browser window in here. And of the Express.js documentation, gonna need that. All right, all right. And I'm gonna need the Hypercore protocol documentation, I'm sure. So now we got that. Wow, look at that great website. Who made that? And then, uh, all right. So, how do we want to start this thing? I guess a pretty straightforward th uh, thing to get started would be just to get the uh, basic uh, uh, API route spec out. I'm going to do this. Um, I'm not going to do uh, web APIs like REST APIs. REST APIs are done. You heard it here first. I'm tired of them. I'm tired of translating RPC calls in between HTTP endpoints. It's ridiculous. It made sense for a time, but now WebSockets are pretty efficient. So we're doing WebSockets, and we're doing JSON RPC over WebSockets. And I'm going to use a proxy on the client so that I don't have to do some kind of schema thing. It just translates whatever you call into a request that goes over the WebSocket protocol, and that's going to be that. I'm tired of those darn REST APIs. Taking a stand. So let's get our endpoints going here. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so we're going over to our Express Docs, and let's, they have that Hello World, so let's just copy that. I'll we'll have to add our folder here. Create index.js and get to importing. We'll change these to ES modules. And make sure that our thing is working. Okay, it looks like I got to do type module over here. All right. We're off and running. All right, so uh, let's get a lib folder going, going here. And we'll do routes, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, let's not get into that yet. Let's just go ahead and write out all our routes. So we got first the front page. I think we'll have a notifications endpoint. We 
Let's consult my notes here. What else are we gonna have? We're gonna have a profile endpoint, which will just show you your currently logged in profile. And then we're gonna have a search endpoint. And then from there, you're gonna need to look at how to spec this, but gonna have it be like Twitter where your username is just right at the top there. So, you know, slash P phrasey would be me. Gonna put a limit on, uh, so basically these will be reserved words, profile notifications and search so that you are, um, you know, can't register those names. Uh, probably want to have a whole registry of reserved names for a given node. Uh, and then I'm going to probably put a requirement that every username has to be at least three letters. So then we are able to, if we ever have some kind of a problem of uh, needing to add more baked in routes, we can always uh, use like slash, um, uh, you know, uh, slash x slash whatever you know so that we kind of have url space available to us hey miguel thanks for joining so let me jump on over to the api reference and i am going to need to know how to spec a route according to some rules Let's make this window bigger so we have more docs on the screen. It's been just a little bit too much time since I did this. So it's that colon syntax, and I believe there's a way to spec rules around. Yeah, all right. So let's see. Let's check the guide on API routing. Route paths. Yep, so they got globs. Do they have a way of specifying constraints? Going to append a regular expression in parentheses. Perfect. All right, so that's going to be like this username with that'll be a non white space I guess really just really anything that's not a forward slash with a minimum of three characters and that should do it let's make sure I got that right Paul worked and PAU worked and PA did not work perfect to do 404 I think actually I can just do app dot all from here. Res dot status four four dot send page not found. That ain't right. Let's see. So if you're not familiar with Express, the routes have a kind of uh, cascading effect. So if none of these hit, then it'll fall back to, to this one right here. Okay, one other thing we're going to need is the WebSockets interface here. So first we need to do, probably going to be a good module for us to, to set up here. All right, looks pretty straightforward. So we'll use a WS. Get that a little bigger for y'all. 
And that'll be... Okay. We'll just copy and paste that code. Actually, you know what? Unless it's a problem for y'all, it's hard for me to, to look at the code when it's that big, so I'm going to go with slightly smaller. All right. Now, I'm not one to dump everything into the top level like this, so let's do um, export function setup. Actually, we'll call it start. And we'll have app be a global. And all this will get constructed here. Now who puts semicolons in their code? That's just wrong. So that's all that. Looks good to me. Let's make sure it runs. Oh. Let's now do a bin.js, which imports setup from index.js and just runs it. And we'll now call bin. Not setup, start. Okay, now let's test that WebSocket real quick. They had some test code in here I think we can grab. I wonder if I can grab the, hmm, do I really need to be using a wrapper around? Nah, I can just do it like that. You know, the WebSocket API for um, that's native isn't that bad. NVN WebSocket. Would rather not get into the build process for the client side yet. All right. And we're going to just dump a little bit of HTML into our response here. Well, specifically JavaScript, but... Let's see what happens when I run that action. Can't establish a connection to WS localhost 3000. Now why would that be? Looks like the get request may be taking precedence, so let's jump this code up real fast and see if that saves it. No, let's make sure I did this correctly. It's sort of weird that it is... Um, shouldn't it should be sending an upgrade request I feel like to that endpoint but the websocket thing is doing a get hmm. let's try moving that to test real fast and getting rid of this be doing a get request when it's trying to establish a 
WebSocket connection. Should be sending an upgrade request, I feel like, if I understand this correctly. Stick a little more. Um, stick a little more login in here. And now the cat wants in, of course. So the upgrade request isn't even being tried. That's kind of odd, right? Is this code coming down correctly? Looks like it. Huh. Let the cat in. You know, my presentation is off. Hang on, let me fix that. All right, hopefully that's a little easier to look at for y'all. If it is just way too small, let me know, but it's definitely easier for me if I can have the code at this size. And let me get that up to there. Okay. You know what I'm just now noticing is I'm not connecting this... WebSocket server to the Express app. Okay, glad to hear that's better. So I didn't do the example correctly. Now what? Yeah, all right. So you got to do app.listen. Oh, okay. I see what I'm doing wrong. Got a fussy cat. This is Kit. Oh. She apparently uh, wants to get a little cuddle in. Who am I to say no? You good? Yeah. I know. Quality cat content. Ugh. Up you go. All right. Okay, so my problem is that I was putting this stuff on the wrong wrong bit this it appears that app.listen returns a server instance and that's what we ought to be attaching the WebSocket to yeah still no good Didn't quite update all my code. Okay, that's looking better. There we go. All right. Now we're in action. WebSocket achieved. All right. So now we got this picked out. It is... Uh, Always kind of funny to build on a stream like this. It's hard to kind of choose priorities and what have you. Let me think. What next? Probably the next thing to do is uh, get my uh, route hosting done correctly. So that we have um, a nice, you know, solution for serving the front end. You get the front end code in there. Um, and then... So get the front end assets handled. So we could hit that, and then we need to get the web the WebSocket API in working order, and then we could start on the actual the database model. So let's do that. 
Now I'm partial to EJS for uh, templating, what templating we have to do, but I'm going to do it mostly as an SPA, so most of the code will be on the front end, and that's on account of how uh, that is on account of the fact that I'm going to be reusing a lot of code that I wrote for the peer-to-peer -peer be Beaker Social and using it here. So we're going to install EJS. Sure, nobody's trying to get in touch with me. People saying nice things, that's always nice. Eight. Now, what am I doing? EJS. And while we're doing this stuff, uh, chat, feel free to hit me up with whatever's going on in your life. We're all here just hanging out, so it uh, don't have, doesn't have to always be related to this stuff. We're here to just enjoy ourselves and have a good time. And if you want to talk about anything I'm doing while we're working on it, suggest changes to how I'm approaching something or anything along those lines, feel free. All right, so we're going to set the view engine by importing EJS, and then we'll do app.set view engine. Anybody here a, uh... oh, hang on, how does this work? He said a string. Oh, it loads it internally. All right then, if you say so, we'll create a static folder for our front end assets, uh, and we'll do index.html, and we'll stick this stuff in. Uh, nope, not index.html. Index.ejs, I think. And yeah, we'll find out in a second. And then we'll take all this action and stick it in here. Cat wants to play. I don't know if y'all can hear that, but she's having a time. All right, and then we'll do res.render index. And let's see how that turns out. So speaking of just hanging in personal lives, anybody here uh, playing anything good lately? Uh, I like to play games lately. I've been trying team fight tactics from LOL. It's not bad. Also trying to get my chess game in order, so I'm watching a lot of chess streamers. Let's figure out how this works here. Fail to look up view in the views directory. Okay, it's got, it expects it to be in a views directory, so let's just call it views then. Stick with the defaults, make life easier for everybody. Okay, still not finding it. Looks like HTML's wrong, let's try EJS. There we go. All right. BMO Studio about to stream playing Outer Worlds. I hear Outer Worlds is pretty good. Like, people were kind of just iffy on it at first, but it seems to still be people kind of sticking with it, liking it. And I guess it's kind of like um, Fallout, right? Which I never really played Fallout. Similar vibes to Fallout, but more space adventure. Yeah, actually, it kind of is like a hybrid between Fallout and uh, Borderlands a little bit. It's kind of got the sense of humor that Borderlands has. Uh, why don't we do it like that? And so we got notifications.ejs, and we got... search.ejs and user.ejs. Let's 
give ourselves a little navigation to test our routes. I'd love to see Hyper used for multi-platform uh, multiplayer platform made with phaser that's a 2021 goal that'd be pretty sweet you know i don't know if it's a perfect fit for that kind of thing but i would never say no to try it could certainly be pretty darn cool in fact all right notifications profile and search good deal Another step forward done. So now we got to think about, oh brother, all the stuff around serving related assets like JavaScript and things like that. And it's probably wise to keep views and front end assets separate. So now I'll go ahead and make that static folder. And that'll be like a folder for the JavaScript and another folder for uh, CSS but actually let's not dig into that yet because I gotta look at what my front end code looks like in fact why not go ahead and remove the JS subfolder because I need to see what all that's gonna look like all right all right all right all right all right What next? Well, I guess it's time to go ahead and start pulling in some of that front end code. Now, let's see where I left all that and <laughs> what it's going to take to get it here. At one point, I started to separate it out into a separate module, and I forget exactly where in its lifetime I did that. A separate repo, that is. But let's go ahead and take a look, see what I put in there. Not that blank. All right. Yeah, okay. Well, let's go ahead and clone this. Always good to hold on to your code. You never know when it's going to come back. Probably a lot of this won't be you know, usable exactly out of the box, but we'll, we'll see what we get here. I'm going to add that folder to the workspace to make copying it easier. did this was in the beaker context it was all front-end code and in particular these applications were actually baked into the browser for quite some time so it's all does none of it had a compile step it was all doing ES modules on the front end that doesn't probably isn't feasible to keep it working that way in the uh, sort of um, final version, so to speak, and the version that we're about to do. And I had the code split up into a kind of shared library, which I called the Beaker App STD Lab, and then the actual social code. So we're going to start by copying in all that STD Lab stuff. And then we'll copy over the actual uh, CSS from the social app and the JavaScript from the social app which is pretty small. And now it's going to be kind of a process of um, 
we'll probably be deleting a lot of that code because not all of it is needed. So we'll just work that as we go. Probably a lot of URL updates and things like that. Now the social index.html is the next thing we've got to look at here. All right, and we're gonna grab that, stick it right here. And gotta copy that out and just save that old index.ejs. Okay, this is going to be a uh, this will be an interesting chunk of work to do here, but let's dig into it. Now, first thing I need to do is get the static route serving. So that means I need to jump over here, and I'm going to add app.get. Now let's see, express static serve. There's probably a module for this that'll help. They do public instead of static. I don't love that. I prefer public. So app.use underneath image, and that'll be express.static. And it's gonna be static slash image. And CSS and JS. Alright, let's see what we see when we load this up. Of course nothing because everything's broken, but we're off to the right start because it is correctly trying to do some stuff. Alright, so the next thing we gotta do is start correcting some of these paths. Let's start with a search and replace. So all the vendor uh, and then like beaker app std live we can just remove those strings and the because of how I copied everything those will just correctly import on over hi Smee how you doing welcome to the stream all right what else we got here the expected vendor okay so I need to copy over that The vendor folder will not persist once we get a compilation step in, but for now we're going to serve the vendor. Got you on my most recent tweet. Nailed ya! Glad to have you here. Okay, looks like we got one more dependency that's found to load, which is this one right here. Okay. Surprised we're not seeing any. Oh, I, I got one more. So glad you forced from wherever. Doing what we do. All right, so I need to change. So I use lit element, which is pretty good. And um, so it actually uses web components. All right, we're making moves. <laughs> so now let's see how many times I reference the Beaker API in here so we know just how much pain we're in for. Well, there's all the times I namespace things with the beaker prefix. You can fix that pretty easy. So that would be any time there's a beaker dash, and we'll just rename that to citizen dash. No problem there. And now let's see how many other times we still use 
B. All right, let's see. So we're using, this is a, we're gonna be looking at APIs here that we didn't end up shipping inside of Beaker. And uh, so uh, things like beaker.index.gql and beaker.session.get, none of that shipped. Wasn't a bad idea. In fact, it's pretty cool, some of the shit, uh, shit it could do, but uh, uh, one didn't end up being right. We basically had the P2P social thing was constructed such that there was an internal database that was acting as an, an aggregator, basically doing what the back end that the uh, citizen uh, application will be doing in the federated context, but inside the browser. And... Uh, uh, Smee's asking if social media is on the horizon for the next release. We're going to do this little experiment as a sort of a hybrid peer-to-peer -peer and federated model. And so that's what I'm working on here. It's not going to ship inside a beaker. It's going to be an application which, uh, if you're using a regular web browser, uh, works as usual. It's using the HyperCore protocol internally for the federation. And ideally, what we'll, the way we'll set this thing up, yeah, proof of concept. And then ideally how we'll set this up is... Um, if you are a Beaker user, you could actually have, you know, um, be a custodian of your own data and just give the URL of your, your, your database to the server so that you retain ownership of it and of the pri uh, private keys for signing, which I think would be pretty sweet. So let's see here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Robert, I'm glad you like the concept. I think it's interesting. You know, uh, finding the you know the most interesting thing we can do within the con kind of constraints we got. Uh, you know, it's a, a bit of a balance, but as long as we can do something kind of novel and get the wheels turning, I think we can keep getting better and better with it. It's me. I'm glad to hear you're going to start getting serious with Beaker. Uh, hope you enjoy it. All right. Oh, man. This is such a big ball of hair, what we're confronted with here, and deciding what to do next is pretty tricky. I suppose, you know, probably one of the best things to do would just be to, be to, to go ahead and um, get the build process in there. And, yeah, I agree. It allows adoption with an easy path to full ownership. That's, that is the angle here. Sounds good, Smee. There's, I have a whole presentation, so jump into your playback, watch that through, rejoin us on the live, and we'll see you when you're back. Uh, all right, I guess I'm going to use Rollup to do my JS compilation. That's kind of my default. I'd like to try to stay away from Webpack, not to harsh on it or anything, but it's just kind of complicated software, and Rollup is pretty tightly designed for what we're doing here. So let's take a look at Rollup JS and see how that's looking these days. Well, let's just install it and see what we get. Oh, gotta choose what we're installing. No modules dot bin roll up and we'll do static JS main dot JS file static js main.build.js format ife okay kind of looks like it worked let's take a look seems right seems small what's going on with that is it is the code really that small that can't be that small no, it's definitely, that's not right. We can easily find out what all is missing by just switching over to main.build.js and taking a look. Gotta start your server first. Why don't we open up a new tab here? See, work, citizen, npm, oh. Node bin. All right. 
Yeah, so it's not doing its imports. So what the heck is that for? Let's see. Is Rollup just... Rollup isn't just... It's a bot. It's a bundler. Why isn't it pulling in all the modules? What is that about? <laughs> Andrew Sullivan asks if I've included all that he's referencing the conversation around the blog post I did earlier. I haven't included all of them yet. It's going to be a long process to get all those pieces in there, but I am hopeful and interested to find out how that goes. Now, why would this thing not include everything? Wondering if we're just going to end up needing to do Webpack. I can't think of the last time I set up Webpack from scratch, so... Let's just... Uh, cross our fingers and hope for the best. Let's uninstall roll up. our webpack.config.js Here's our basic version of it. Let's get that in there. Entry point is static JS main.js. The output is static JS main uh, static JS with main.build.js. No modules that band webpack. Let's see what happens. I guess we do. The segmentation fault. That's exciting. Let's see if it's because I changed it to ES modules. Segmentation fault. How the heck are we pulling that off? <laughs> Might have to do some Googling to figure that out. <laughs> All right, webpack segmentation fault. Front on NPM rebuild. I know. 
You know you're doing something in, uh, exciting when you manage to pull that off. All right, well, let's try installing everything fresh. Gravy. Didn't know I had it in me. Let's make sure I follow the getting started guide, right? Yeah. Huh. What an exciting turn of events. What version of Node am I using? Well, let's try installing the most recent version of Node 14 and <laughs> see if that's the cause here. these issues filed are from like 2015 and 2016. I haven't tried the max old space size flag yet. I feel like we'd be getting a different error than a seg fault for that. <laughs> this is really wild. Thanks. Try that. Is it like that? I don't know what the syntax is for NPM RC. Of course, I'm not running this via NPM. Okay, well, this is giving us more information. Huh, I wonder if that's actually solved it, because now it didn't seg fault. Now it's actually giving me a useful, let's, let's try it. Renaming it real quick and seeing if that's doing it. Nah, it's just being cool now. What the heck is that about? Yeah, 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 I understand what the parameter is meant to do. Uh, but that is bizarre. Now it's now it's okay. Invalid host defined options though. Failed to load webpack.config.js. Maybe I screwed it up when I messed around with it. Let's try copying this again and starting from scratch. I, I can't really begin to imagine what the heck happened there, but okay, whatever, you know. Static JS main, and then we'll change this to Let's try it again. That's still un invalid host defined options. That's not exactly helpful either. You could at least tell me what I'm doing wrong. Golly. Build tools in JavaScript. It just works. Come on.
It's going to be 95% of the stream just trying to get this thing to work. See if I got this usage right. Right, deer name is not specified inside of uh, the REPL, which isn't really helpful, but that usage is right. Oh, what are you doing to me? Between uh, webpack and rollup. Maybe I can get roll up working again. I've heard good things about Snowpack, but Snowpack is really opinionated. And I would prefer to minimize the amount of opinion I'm bringing in here. problem I was having with rollup was it's not import you know, bundling everything that's getting imported which seems like what it's supposed to be doing Well, if, we're, if I'm having this much trouble with Webpack and it's not what I wanted to use in the first place, so if I'm going to be struggling, I might as well struggle with roll it. Good grief. <coughs> see what happens if I don't spec what the output format is. What's the default going to give me? Nothing. It's just keeping it with imports. With a bizarre decision about how to <coughs> resolve those paths. Alright, well then, let's see here. What is my options on the bundle form format. You document the different formats? Come on. <coughs> I did have some roll up involved with Beaker, so why don't I try to pull from that? Maybe I had some answers in there for what I'm dealing with. So that's in scripts, tasks, and build. Let's call it the bundle function, which I import from here. And that I'm calling rollup with the defaults. Uh, CJS was my output, was my format. And then I would browse verify, which I believe was related to, uh, yeah, see, that's just turning it into requires. And I'm not just trying to transform into requires. I'm actually trying to bundle. You would think that a bundler would bundle by default. Maybe I have to call browse verify after to actually make that happen. Uh, 
a step-by-step -step tutorial. First, you do what? He's using IIFE, -E, I -I -E, and then what? So this is kind of old. Hey, Bushnelli. We are working on JavaScript build tools at the moment. I'm trying to wrap my head around how to get Rollup to actually bundle in the imports. I feel like Rollup does more than just convert between different forms, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm just going to need Browserify. I don't want to try using, I'm guessing that's an older version of Webpack, and I don't want to, you know. I understand, you know, some people like to hold out for the old with the old versions, but you know that comes with its own set of problems. I'm sympathetic to some degree to what they're dealing with, but I'm also kind of not. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Got all these plugins. But I don't think, I mean, is the common JS one doing the actual bundling, or what is happening with this? Well, maybe the problem is just that uh, there's something weird with, because like some of it's happening, it's just not getting everything. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. So this approach is getting us some of it, but not all of it. Now, why would it be like that? Also, of course, Mad Science Town is the wrong name. It should be Mad Science City. It's not getting lit element imported. Maybe that's because lit element is actually not in ES modules. It is, it's definitely missing dependencies, but why? That is the mystery. Because if I import the... Oh, you know what? I got a lot of imports that are using absolute paths, and that is probably what this is. <clears throat> Using the absolute paths worked whenever I was just ser when I'm serving just directly off the server. But of course, when you're doing the bundler, that ain't gonna fly. Thankfully, it's not too many of them. Thankfully, it's very few, in fact. Uh, let's see, so that'll be, any of the vendor ones will be out the directory in that. Oh. Let's try it again. May have given roll up an unfair shake here. It's complaining about lit element. I'm not sure why. Okay, ha, finally we're we're in business. That wasn't great, but there we have it.
<laughs> Party. Um, okay. Boy, important a big ball. Ball of code. You know, it's got benefits, but it's also got downsides. But it is what it is. Now, I'm not going to bother with cleaning the site structure up quite yet. I don't think. No, I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup on this, on this code structure. So, uh, Mef asks, what are you trying to build on right now? I saw Beaker's undefined. Are you trying to make Beaker a library so you can use this functionality in other browsers or something? No, nope. uh, no, I'm not. If anybody's just joining, feel free to jump to the playback. I did a nice little kind of presentation at the start talking about everything we're doing here. We're basically making a mad science project that is a hybrid federated and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, social network. And, uh, oh, cancel that. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm taking code that I built for uh, what we were calling Beaker Social, which was a sort of purely peer-to-peer -peer social application that was uh, baked into Beaker for a, a stretch of about six months while, uh, of last year. We ended up ditching it, but we saved the code. So now I'm copying that code over. And any reference it has to Beaker, at this point, we're going to end up replacing those references to the back end of our um, federated nodes. Um, and it'll end up being a hybrid, ideally, where um, uh, in some cases it'll be talking to the back end. In some cases, if you're using Beaker, you could actually be writing to your data structures locally and syncing it up to the server. Um, so. What we were just trying to deal with the roll-up was just getting the basic front end uh, doing roll-ups. So now we need to rearrange our code structure a little bit here. And I'm going to start with clipboard, and we're just going to... Yeah, it should be cool. I think so. That's old. That goes. That stays. I think emojis stay. And now emoji goes. We can always pull that back if we needed it. FS goes. Functions stays. Is exterior is uh, is the extension binary stays. Query params goes. Quill goes. Uh, records goes. Eventually I'll have to replace that though. Strings stays and time stays. All right, now let's fix any of those imports. Clipboard. Oh, I used that more than I thought. Let's see. Okay, that's just the vi Visual Studio import being fussy. All right, I only use it one place. That's good. All right, so that's in sites list, so that actually needs to be lib. Ooh, I used fs in some places, so that's just going to have to be a 404. No problem, bro. Feel free, anybody, ask me um, for again for a recap on what's going on. So that's the clipboard. Import fix. Let's get the dom.js import fix now. And we can actually automate this with uh, lib dom. No, no, no. I'm modifying the wrong thing there. Oh, shoot. I didn't want to do that. No, brother. I just modified. Yes, uh, the Monaco stuff. Let's just get that out of the JS um, space because that's really a vendor dependency. All right, next up is functions. Using that in one place. And then we got is extension binary. Looks like we're not using that anywhere, so we'll go ahead and remove that. And strings and time. Yep, 
Yeah, Bushnelli uh, is talking about how yesterday he was trying to use the hype CLI to serve things over HTTP. The biggest problem was encountering a lot of Beaker superpowers not working regular browsers. That is definitely one of the tricks to this, unfortunately. Not having the custom APIs is kind of a limiter. Huh, time doesn't get used anywhere. All right, let's see what happens when I try to build now. All right, so we got some code still using that FS module, which is not surprising, but I'm just going to have to comment it out for now because that is uh, beaker specific code that is not going to be in, in use here. All right, then we got a records.js. That makes sense. Comment that out for now as well. Did I lose the post composer? No, it's right here. Okay, that's why that was where it was. Okay, gonna need to grab the VS dependency again, which is where. Right here. So that actually, let's see. Let's stick. VS here in the vendor directory, but then move suggestions into here. Uh huh. And let's find the suggestions usage. couple of libs slash libs in here so let's fix that and just the one okay another step complete that's a good deal one other thing I gotta do is fix this path right ah let's see I put it in vendor Well, might as well just serve vendor. I'm just going to go ahead and let y'all talk to each other and not always comment on, on uh, everything. So, Oh, I'm already served vendor. That's good. Okay. That's right. So over here, and I need to change that to vendor. Okay, so we're sort of back in business, though some of the some of the imports I didn't update, so they are erroring at the moment, and we'll deal with that when the time comes. Now, one other thing that I got to think about how to fix is I have a terrible design right now for how to deal with CSS, because of how lit element works, you have to actually be able to load the the CSS from the JavaScript. <laughs> it's kind of a thing. And so I have these duplicates where it's like CSS and then like a copy of it with CSS.js where it's like, uh, let's see, if you got these definition, color definitions, and then the CSS.js is like a copy of it with JavaScript wrapper around it. And it's just like, it sucks. So I got to see if I can find a way to clean this up so I don't have these duplicate files, which is always a nightmare. So we're going to have to cross that bridge at some point. Okay, so we got our build step done and we copied over our front end code, so we're making progress here. Probably the next thing to do What's the next thing to do? 
We could start on getting the database layer done, or we could hit the RPC web API. I feel like the RPC web API would be a, an interesting thing to hit first so that we could just start calling against the back end so that as we're adding things in, we'll be able to talk to it. So why don't we start with that? Let's start by getting a JSON RPC module done. I don't need it. Well, let's take a look at this client library real quick. We might want to have some. No, that's kind of old. Let's see. all I need is some of the basic utilities and then we're going to wrap it with our own solution here dollar sign create yikes expose functions that's not what I'm looking for Now this is looking closer to what we're looking for. It's got WebSocket code in it, which is maybe a little bit more than we need. And I don't want to actually have a register on the server side, I don't think. I think I'd like it to just emit what's getting called and let me handle that part of the logic. This may still be too opinionated. Well, that's not bad. I think JSON I'm somewhat familiar with. Looks a little opinionated, but not bad. That's kind of what I'm looking for from the client side. Let's try to find its API here. Ah. Looks like it's just bundles of the code, perhaps.
I usually try to avoid having periods on the stream where I'm just reading docs and not saying anything, but unfortunately this is one of those situations where I'll have to, so please excuse that. This looks pretty close to what I'm looking for here. They have this kind of, uh, appreciated, uh, Bushnelli. They have this sort of unopinionated, uh, version of it right here, which looks pretty good because it allows me to plug in the WebSocket interface for it. I seem to recall doing some work on this in the past. Let's see if I happen to have a repo that gets us close to where we want to be. Yeah, I have messed with this. No, no, this was something else. But this was close. Let's see here. This may be our, uh, our, our, our solution here. And what was the, I had some kind of small set of changes I made which led to the fork. This might be what we need on the server side for sure. It's pretty much handling a lot of the complexities for us, except it's on its own. So the question is, can I pass in, can I make it interact with uh, Express? I'm sure they got something for that. Pro features. Wow. Monetizing that open source, got no, uh, no hate for you there. All right, there we got API documentation here. Let's see if I got that code sitting around in my work folder. Well, that's not quite what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for file names. Inside of work. And can you give me some like better options? Come on, Max Search. Good gravy. All right, fine. Okay, there it is, JSON RPC. Let's see if that's interesting. This is an idea I've been fussing with for a while. Uh, yeah, all right, I got some of the code here, it looks like. Holy hell, did I write this? <laughs> yeah, it looks like I went all out. I wonder how much of this I... Hmm. I'm using writable streams and stuff.
Who uses that? I actually did manage to do a lot of what I was aiming for here. So let's see how close this is to usable. Oh, kitty cat. So it looks like I have some of the JSON RPC behaviors built in, but not all of them. That's not great. All right, well, it's good to have this as a resource, but I'm not fussing around with old half-finished code. Huh. At the time, I felt like I needed to do my own version of the JSON RPC implementation. It doesn't speak well to what I'm going to be able to pull from here, but... Okay. Well, that looks good. That all looks useful. And on the server side, the question is, can I set it up with Express? Let's see if anybody's filed any issues about this. Okay, you can specify a server parameter in the constructor. Apparently, maybe, maybe not. Well, if you can, it is not doc. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Do they not fully document their code here? Socket that. Server options. Okay, so it takes in, it looks like the same parameters that we're already using. Not you. Get out of here, you. I need this one. All right, let's give it a shot. sockets and then over here it's like that and then we'll just do this Okay, here we got the client side. And we need a bundled version of that so that we can, or we go into our, let's see here. So now we're getting into needing to include node modules in our static code. A little sloppy, but let's just give that a shot. So I'm going to go to static here. I'm going to npm init y npm install rpc websockets. And from our 
main, I'm going to just dump into the top that example code. Okay, let's see if it worked. RPC WebSockets is not defined. Okay, so we got a build problem. Now, before I forget, let's move this call that I'm doing for the build into our NPM scripts. Now I can just run NPM build. Missing global variable name. Use outputs.global to specify. So RPC WebSock is, is for some reason confusing the thing. Let's take a look inside and see what that is. Okay, so let's take a look at how to do roll up node modules. I mean, it seems like it, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Let's see here. Nah, so it's just not finding it. <clears throat> well, let's try adding this plugin and see if it solves our problem here. to create our rollup.config what the heck did I do a search inside of I guess I did yeah whatever See if that magically solved a problem. Doesn't look like it. Nope. Okay. All 
making progress. Looks like my usage is wrong. So let's take a look at what that could be. It doesn't seem to export something called client. What does it export? Eh, it should. All right, well, maybe it's uh, not named uh, exports like that. So I just got to do um, RPC WebSockets. Default isn't exported either, so okay. Okay, still angry. What do we got? Okay, config issue. So this has to be static slash js main.build.js. All right. And what do we got? Check dependency list. Synchronous require cannot resolve module babel runtimes helper interrupt require default. And that sounds like something you Google. So is that is that in the bundle? Well, our bundle is big now. All right, let's see. Yep, right there. Now, who the heck is doing that? That looks like. Looks like something that roll up is putting in there. It is. Why does it think? Of, okay. Let's try. Um, maybe part of the problem here. Client is not exported. Let's just do a console.log on what we're importing here and find out what the heck that's about. And I can't begin to imagine why that would just change on us like that. Okay. Oh man. JS bundlers are a real joy, aren't they? What the heck? Well, let's see if we can avoid using node modules here. Like maybe, 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 maybe the distributed version of this thing. Yeah, it's already browser bundled for us. Indeed it is, except it is using the Babel requires as well. Hmm. Well, let's try Try using this. Is it exporting anything? What does this thing look like? That's an IIFE, so it looks like it's, you know, it's doing. Oh lord, that is a bizarre bit of code right there.
We're almost there, I suppose. Uh, that bundle that I... So basically what I'm trying to do is avoid using node modules inside of the static directory because I'm having trouble getting the RPC WebSockets to, to bundle correctly that way. I'm looking inside the distribution. You have yet to experience the fullness and joy for JavaScript. I don't know if that exists. Or if it, is, if it does exist, you're looking at it. Um, and it looks like the bundle is what I want to be using, but it looks like it's an IIFE. So it's like defining property on exports, but what is exports? It's doing that whole thing. Well, let's just try it. Yeah, this is you're you're seeing it now, huh? What what's not to love? Yeah. Okay. So that's not getting exported. I don't want to like manually modify this thing, but I will if I have to. Do not think I wouldn't. It's a self-executing function. It's passing in F. It looks like it doesn't do anything, to be honest. It looks like it's defining the function and then like not calling it. So it defines this function that Nope. Get back here. That ends over here, and then it passes in a function, which is this whole thing. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Trying to figure out what this thing actually does. I'm guessing it's possible that this, this bundle is designed that you would be able to, like, import it as a script. <laughs> yeah, mind blown. Well, let's try this. Let's try loading it. Try loading it like that. It still says the client is not exported though. So I'm guessing I'm gonna get an empty object again. No, it's gonna complain about uh, interop require default. That's just a plugin that I need to include. Oh gosh. This sucks. Okay, another option is that we go into the static node modules, uh, RPC web sockets, and then we from here call roll up and try to produce our own bundle.
except it doesn't have all the code, so I need to, need to clone it because it's only shipping the build. Oh, gosh. All right. Guess we're cloning. big repo. Or a slow download. I guess it was a little bit of both there. Alright. See so, I gotta do our NPM install. Well that's rolling. Gonna add it to our workspace here. Looks like index.browser. Oh, it's in TypeScript. Okay. So that means Rollup won't be able to do it on its own, but they probably have their own build process. And it's Babel that they're using. And then Browserify. So. Ooh, let's see, if I remove the Browserify step, no, that wouldn't do it alone. But maybe I can configure, well, let's see, what is the index, does it, yeah, it's supposed to export things. But Browserify probably is producing a self-executing bundle that you include via script. So I, let's, let's see what we get if we don't have the Browserify step. Oh, in fact, that's what index.browser.js gets us, which we have over here. That looks like this. Which should mean that we can call roll up on this. So let's try it. Um, all right, so we're going to do build ts index.browser.js we're going to output into vendor rpc websockets bundle let's take a look and see what that gave us okay we're closer here except that it has some node module dependencies, in particular event emitter and circular JSON. And I'm inclined to manually solve that problem. Now event emitter 3, I feel like you could probably just extend the actual browser primitive, but they must have made that choice for a reason, so I'm not going to claim to know better. I'm just going to copy that over. And same same move with circular JSON. So now we have manually constructed that bundle. If we are lucky. <laughs> Still getting that interop require default. Is that in the bundle? Where am I pulling? No, I'm pulling from node modules. Okay, it failed. 
Why did it fail? Because it's still got that import line in there. So that's solved. And is it exporting? It is. I'm never going to be able to update this dependency, but it looks like we're in action now. We're in business. So now, God help us all. It looks like I should be able to do our test code. Easy as that. We have JSON RPC over the wire. Golly. Wonder if they got looks like Firefox doesn't have a WebSocket wire inspector. Okay, so next up <laughs> Now that we have completed the simple task of importing a module dependency and bundling it, all right, next thing I'm going to clean up a little bit. I'm going to get rid of this node modules here. It's inside of static, and I'm going to get rid of all the package stuff there. So that's, that's right out. And now I'm going to wrap this WebSocket client interface casting over. I don't know what you mean by that. Ah. Choosing third parties to plan our proof of concept. Yeah. Yep. Yes, indeed. So, here is where this gets to be fun. is that we should be able to replace this. So first of all, this can be an await call. And that's doing it in the, you know, what you might call uh, raw version of it. But then we should be able to, with the proxy, do await api dot sum five three. We need to get a watcher going. Yep. All right, so check this out. Using a proxy object, we can wrap around this ws.call syntax to make it look like we're just calling a native J JavaScript API. And so api.sum translates to ws.call sum, and then the parameters get passed in there. So now it's basically like whatever the server exports we don't need to have any kind of manifest. We don't need to import any API definition. It just automatically sends over the JSON RPC request to the server side to try it. And if it works, it doesn't. It, it's great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And not working would look like this. Not real method. And that'll just fail using the JSON RPC API, uh, uh, wire protocol and you know so send back an error response and there you go method not found yet yeah, don't want to do manifests okay now of course uh, you know, to some degree, manifest can be helpful in some cases, but if it's all async await, all just kind of a promises interface, it's no problem. 
All right, so let's move that into the library here. Okay, so now we have a nice handy solution to creating new endpoints, or to creating new APIs. So now it's just, you know, um, it'll look like this. You would do uh, import create as create our C API from our C API.js, and then you would just do Simple as that. So now our front end can talk to our back end. Let's take half a second to first of all clean this up. Don't need you, don't need you, or you, or you. And then on the API side, let's take a look. So you register that stuff. You can set a user defined auth method. Curious to see how that works. We got namespaces, don't think we need that. You got a minute. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Probably want to have some kind of error handling, so like if the wire gets disconnected, we can respond to that, but we'll worry about that another time. So really it's just a bunch of server.register stuff. And All right. So now that we have a way to talk to the server, that's done, and I guess it's time no longer can put off registering the, or, uh, getting started on the database layer. So I think it's time to do that. Before we do that, I'm gonna use the bathroom real quick, get myself another drink. So a little timeout. I'm gonna mute my stuff, so. Uh, let's see here, I will BRB. Okay. Make sure nothing blown up on Twitter or anything. Okay. Nothing going wrong or anything. That's good. <laughs> 
So on IRC, uh, like you just said, my accent is thicker since he last heard me. It sort of depends on my vibe. When I'm feeling sort of relaxed or... Uh, honestly, I'll so, sort of slip into it either if I'm being really friendly or if I'm um, a little more unsure of myself. <laughs> the thing that's funny about accents is uh, a Texas drawl lets you chew your, your... like elongate your vowels, so when you're kind of searching for words... It makes life a little easier. It's got the kind of easy vibe. But like when I'm giving talks and when I know what I'm talking about, I'll get rid of it and I'll talk like this. And I'll use this very specific Midwestern accent. <laughs> I don't know how that ended up happening that I have these two different vibes, but I do. And uh, it's not always like on, on purpose. Sometimes I just slip into one or the other. Sometimes it's on purpose, but... Sometimes when I'm traveling in Europe and I'm meeting people that are new, I've found that uh, the Texas accent, actually, people kind of like that, like if I meet a lot of strangers. <laughs> I don't know how long Texas will be popular internationally if we keep on filing lawsuits trying to interrupt elections. I didn't love that for the Texas brand, but what can you do? None of that action. Not having it. Very American. That's right. All right. So, for the database layer, oh man, there's going to be a lot that we got to figure out. I'm probably going to have to create some submodules that maybe get published separately, but. Um, the next step here. There's a couple of things. There's first of all going to have to be some kind of server config, like a JSON file or something, which specifies like what the keys are to the different databases, some kind of setup, putting their stuff like the ports being used by the server, stuff like that. So we'll need some server config management at some point. That's one thing we'll need. And then, what else are we going to need? We're going to need, of course, to set up the hyperspace daemon and have that running. We're going to need the server database. And we're going to need the user databases and code wrap and all that. Okay, okay, okay. Another ball of mud to break into here. Or rather, a ball here. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. Nope, not there, not in the chat. All right. So we'll just call the uh, whole hyperstack aspect of it. We'll, call it, we'll put all that in. Uh, <laughs> we'll put all that in the DB folder. Maybe we'll rename it to hyper at some point, but for now we'll call it DB. And we'll export an async setup function. Now I'm going to refer to my handy boilerplate code that I put together on the Hypercore website. You know what? I can't play music on the stream, sadly, because I'll get a copyright strike, but I can listen to it, and I'm going to do that. Hopefully that won't distract me too much. 
Usually it doesn't, but I don't know what it's like when I'm streaming. You never know. <laughs> all right, all right. I've got The weekend stuck in my head right now. I'm just now getting into his stuff. All right. Get your beat going, right? You know what, that made a little, yeah. Let's move this into, let's call this the, the hyperspace .js. And um, so this is set up so that it's gonna try to connect to the hyperspace daemon. And if it's not running, it's gonna just create it in process. We could have it spawn in a separate process. It might be better, but eh, for now, we'll leave it as it is. <coughs> And let's, um, a couple of things we need to do here. First thing is, um, uh, we're gonna just do some test db hyperspace. See, I knew this would happen. Now I'm not inclined to talk because I'm jamming. All right, and one other thing that needs to happen is we need to listen to the about to. Uh, it's the not before. Is it before exit? Oh, no, no. Okay. Before exit, I think. Because we need to call that cleanup code. Let's take a look at the docs on this real quick. Now, I believe I can do async work here. It's emitted when it's empty. It's shutting down. Listener callback is invoked with the value. Uh, not emitted. Okay. So that's not ideal. I think actually what I want to do is similar to what the hyperspace demon does which is um, catch the SIGINT and try to do a clean shutdown. Basically, hyperspace, if it's running in process, it wants, it needs to, there's a way to do a clean exit out of the DHT, uh, which is ideal. Um, keeps the, keeps things a little cleaner in the uh, um, DHT tables, don't have stale entries that have to, you know, time out. But it could take a couple of seconds. Um, yeah, there it is. There's their close. And how do they use close? Yeah, so on sig term or sig int, they call close. Which I suppose is, yeah, okay. So, looks like We'll can do the same thing because it looks like what they're doing is um, I'm looking at the you know, Andrew and Matias's code. It looks like how they're handling that is rather than responding to a sig int or a sig term by process on exit, they're just scheduling more work. But that work that gets scheduled should actually end the work scheduled and cause the node process to exit naturally because there's no more queued work, which is when node process is automatically closed. So we're gonna do the same thing and. For us, there's just we'll not only need to um, shut down the hyperspace uh, demon, but we also will have to um, shut down the server. We should probably serve that close. So let's see if that works for us. 
and went away. Okay. Cleanup is not a function. that it did exactly what we need it seems like it closed oh no it's closing fast because we're not running the daemon in process so why don't we actually shut down the daemon make sure all this is working correctly so we're shutting down the daemon that i got running constantly all right worked correctly well it's closing pretty fast but i'm not gonna sweat that if it's wrong we'll fix it later let's go ahead and spawn my persistent daemon again hey All right, so we got hyperspace rolling. Now let's get a wrapper around that for databases in general. I'm going to give it the similar function signatures of setup and cleanup. And we're going to move to hyperspace management code. Move that in here. And for now, we'll start by just wrapping those falls. Nope. There we go. Alright. <clears throat> that much is handled. And now... I need to get the config aspects involved here now because there needs to be a flow where it checks to see if there's a config and if there is it's going to create the uh, it's going to use that config and if not it's going to have to go through a setup flow which would involve creating a hyper b database for the server okay let's see well we can write some of that code um, and we'll do that, we'll call the, uh, we'll call them the server databases and the user databases. This is the first time I'm actually building something like we're describing here, so I'm going to have to experiment a little bit with how to go at this, but I'm thinking we do... Two different classes here because the uh, server has two different databases. We may need a uh, base database here, a base class for the databases. We'll import the hyperspace client. And you know what else we need to do? Is import the, or is install the uh, hyperb module. And we're gonna import that. Let's jump over to our boilerplate example code here so I can check my usages. Okay. All right, so key, if type of key is string, we're gonna convert it to a buffer. And then this will be 
And if it's not set, it needs to be null. And that means that this uh, that the get will do uh, if so. If key is null, it's going to create a new hyper B because if you call null on get with the client .core store API, it'll actually create a new hyper core. And if key is populated, it'll load it. After that, we're going to uh, want to uh, you know save that key uh, and I guess what we'll do is if not this dot key this dot uh, we're gonna save the key first and then we're gonna do this dot on uh, database created. And that'll be a stub function for the subclasses to override. straightforward and so then inside of server we'll import our base class we'll have both of these extend from that and we'll start by just going ahead and overriding these stubs Now, eventually, we're going to want to <coughs> set these things up so that they uh, save the config. But for now, we're just going to console log it. we should do in that base is hold on to the hyper beam so hyper bees are key value databases they're built on a single hyper core uh, it's a little complicated to kind of uh, wrap your head around at first but basically the hyper core is an independently log that you can build lots of different kinds of data structures on top of hyper b is what a uh, key value database built on top of a single hypercore. So the whole way this functions is you're getting the hypercore right there, passing it into the hyperb, and the hyperb is wrapping that hypercore API with the sort of key value database mechanisms. And so that's what the b.feed is referring to as the hypercore, and that's where I'm getting the key from it. So now we can import our two server database definitions. And we'll have export let public server db. And we'll create both. So if I run this now, we should get two hyper -Bs created. Uh, all right. OK, I got an import mistake here, right there. And there's a mistake I made over here. So 
So that works correctly. That's good. Probably don't want to be dumping those keys with that ugliness. So let's fix that. All right, that's that. Now we're next. The config would not be a bad thing to hit, or we can keep developing. Yeah, let's just. Mm, yeah, we should probably hit the config now because we're gonna want to um, persist these databases while we're testing them out. Uh, so let's probably look for some node modules for config because there's some pretty handy tools out there for this. Hey, an exact match. Well, let's take a look at it. So it gives you a default config file. Handy idea. Now this seems to be kind of biased towards, um, you know, how you normally do node apps, which is their in-house thing, and so your config, it kind of seems like their configs are, are expecting them to be inside the code base. They have, uh, they have articles. Okay. Well, it's certainly featureful. Allows you to do JSON, JSON five, that's handy because JSON 5 is pretty nice compared to uh, regular JSON for config. You can do comments and hex. Hex actually could be you know, kind of handy given that we're doing the keys. What other formats they got? Human JSON. That's a new one. Ah, YAML too. Of course, if we're allowing all of these, then we kind of can't rely on the, on the hex inside of the uh, JSON 5, because probably needs to be strings in that case. This is okay. I mean, I kind of have a... I know that YAML has its problems, but I kind of default to it. Oh, they do have TOML. Let's do TOML. I like TOML. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so this looks like a pretty good safe choice. Uh, except for the fact that it's kind of weird how it does its default. No, we can configure it, so. All right, we'll do that. Plus it's got a nice handy API. Does it have a way to set values from the live environment and write it back? Now that's an interesting question. Because that's an interesting question though. Should we even be doing that? Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean. Yeah, but so now that's an interesting question though because we're gonna be writing TOML files and TOML, writing TOML versus writing JSON is kind of different, so. Maybe we should be not thinking about this particular piece in terms of config, but thinking of it in terms of state and having like a .json that's separate from the config where this stuff is being stored. That might be a, a, the wiser choice here. And so with that in mind, 
we may still use config, so we'll go ahead and leave that installed. Um, I'm guessing a citizen module already exists. Oh, it doesn't. None of y'all steal this. I guess I could go ahead and do my... Uh... Yeah, I'm doing it. I'm going to go ahead and publish that, because I don't trust any of y'all. If anybody here takes it before I can get it, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> don't do it to me, please. That would be so rude. So I figure it's a good idea to, to claim the module name now because I'm going to use .citizen in the home deer to store config and stuff. <clears throat> a little cleaner if I know that I got the module locked down. Okay. Next up, we're going to create a... Yeah, we'll just put this in the index.js. So we're going to import the FS module. We're also going to import path and OS. And right here, we're going to do let um, db config equals wait. Actually, we'll make DB config a global here. things first we set up the config path which will be path.join os.homedeer dot ctzn and then it's going to be uh, dbconfig.json we're going to read that file fs.read file at the config path There's two kinds of errors we could get here. One is file not found. That's no problem. We just go ahead and create it. And the other is that the uh, file uh, fails to read for some other reason. Slightly different sitch. Um, let's blog the error for now so I can see what the param is so I can uh, deal with it correctly. And then when that happens, we do uh, a default config object, which is just an empty, well, no, it'll be um, public server undefined, and private server undefined. Saving, we just uh, first do await mkdir at the uh, 
make sure it exists. And then we'll do write file at the config path. We'll stringify the config. Uh, make it even readable with some nice indentation. And actually, those should be null. And now let's add some validation. Uh, if config.public server No, we need to do this one at a time because there are different actions that we take. So if it's not defined, we just set it to null. No problem there. But if it is defined, but there's something wrong with it, we gotta bomb out and let the user know. We can't just default, you know, nuke it. put this in an else. So we need to make sure that they have a string and then we need to um, do a regex on it. Simple enough. Same logic for the private server. Now we got to define that hyper key. This is super easy to do. The regex for this, because it's a 64 character hex string. So you just do zero through nine, A through F, 64 characters long. That's that. Make it case insensitive. That doesn't matter. All right, and then right here, we're gonna pass in the config. All right, and then there's one last thing we gotta do, which is save when it changes, which we could either detect when they change and write only then, or we could just write every time. I'm inclined to do the latter. The file write is cheap, doesn't really um, matter that much. So, um, uh, you know, hopefully I'm not wearing out people's SSDs, but should be fine. So in that case, we'll do this, public server db, dot b, dot feed, dot, you know what, we're gonna wrap that. We're gonna put a, getter oh no it already has that yeah no need to do that all right all right Let's see if uh, if it worked. Yeah. Okay. So let's first hit that error where uh, we're gonna if e dot code equals no int. 
fact, no, we'll do it like this. Fail to read. Uh, and then we'll do the path, uh, which is config path. And we'll bomb out. If it's anything other than not found, then that's a problem. And let's take a look. All right, looks good. So let's see if uh, it loads correctly. Yeah, it looks good. It's just that we accidentally are MK during when we don't need to, which I might handle by just ignoring. So we'll try to MK deer every time and ignore the failure. All right. Okay, so that's another thing handled. So let's go ahead since we got the get repo going now. Um, uh, read and store database config from. Uh, eh, we'll just do it. And while we get our get ignore going, no point in leaving that uh, out. So that'll be. DS store as always. Don't want the node modules. Don't want the package lock. And in this case, we might actually want the package lock. But I don't worry about that. Okay, so now we got databases being properly created. So now some of the interesting questions to address is actually getting into like schemas and things. <laughs> when I mentioned this is a big ball of hair, <laughs> wasn't kidding. Oh, there's so many steps here. <laughs> so now we have to think about things like schemas and layout of the database. And I think I got the juice for it, so let's get into it. So Greg asked, why not commit package lock? It's a, uh, people sometimes disagree on this, but the main logic for not doing it is that um, the package lock.json changes a whole lot between when npm installs occur, and it's full of a lot of kind of not very useful information to look at, and so, um, a lot of people don't like having that noise in like pull requests and in commits. Um, of course, the purpose of the package lock is to uh, try to you know have reproducibility um, between uh, deployments. And so like if you commit it, um, then you're sort of um, able to say whenever you do an NPM install um, elsewhere, if you can detect if anything changed. Um, but uh, I've heard mixed things about how useful that is in practice. So, you know, for now I'm going to default to just not. All right. So. Well, let's get into how these databases are going to be laid out. Um, this is a key value, Hyper-B is a key value database, which if you've ever worked with level DB, you'll be somewhat familiar with it. And so the way that a key value database works, you know, is that you'll have a key space of, you know, um, foo, bar, baz, and each of them will have values. And you think of them as being alphabetically ordered or lexicographically ordered. And so you could do, you know, get bar and, you know, put bar one, two, three, four. And then a lot of what you end up doing is reading key range, uh, reading from ranges. So like you do a create read, you know, create read stream. And it'll be like greater than and equal to 
var less than or uh, c. We'll do it like this: greater than or equal to b, less than or equal to c, well, less than c. So this will basically get me every uh, entry in the database that starts with the letter b. Um, and on top of that, we have in the Hyper B API the ability to um, do sub databases, which is sub. And so that uses a sort of single null, you know, zero value as a separator. So you can see the usage here. So it would be like um, db dot sub um, that would get you the my group and then that separator, which is actually a null character and then foo. And uh, that's sort of handy because then you can do, um, you can kind of treat the sub almost like its own database. It has all the same API. And so it's a way of doing namespacing effectively. And so uh, when we're laying out the data, we're gonna wanna lay it out with these namespaces, these subs, um, to kind of act as logical, almost like tables within the database. So now, you know, I apologize, I should have increased the font size for this part. Okay, so that's the kind of tools we have available. And so now what we have to think about is like what those namespaces are and how the data is laid out within them. Now I'm going to use a syntax of like um, that, where the vertical pipe repre represents that, that null separator. All right, so that's step one here. Now step two is that we have um, the schema design that I talked about earlier, which is that I, I want to actually have a sort of an explicit system for um, declaring uh, the schemas that each of those namespaces are using um, and having those schemas be machine readable and enforced by the uh, um, server node. And so um, we're going to call those namespaces tables. And so we're going to have a tables table, and then it's going to be the table ID. And then it's going to be a table definition. And then it's going to be table ID. And what will ex exist within those tables will be, um, if anybody has a better idea than table, you know, we can talk about it. But and so then inside of each of the tables, uh, there will be a definition that is specific to the schema. We should probably also have some kind of identifier, like uh, citizen which is a citizen header. <clears throat> so the citizen header, all of our values are either going to be JSON or binary. Binary in the case of media assets. And then we're just going to stick the media assets into the Hyper-B, which has some considerations. Uh, you know, if you're trying to do a, a, a read of multiple values, you may be pulling down more data than you'd prefer to. But I'm going to do it that way and worry, you know, have it all grouped together. It should be more convenient that way. And if it doesn't work out, then we can always find another solution to it. So citizen header, um, it's going to be, let's give it a version. And we're going to have it have a um, 
db type, which will be either server public, server private, or user. And citizen may not actually, citizen is actually um, prob, you know, meant to be about like the schemas that are involved here and the kind of design of the application semantics. So using citizen as the identifier for the header is probably not what we want to do here. So why don't we do something that might be a little more generic and reusable in the future. Um, so basically, you know, Hyper-Vs are unopinionated about how the data is laid out within them. And I'm just going to use a set of opinions. We do have a name already, calling it citizen, CTZN. Um, probably we'll call my the node that I deploy something like Mad Science, but the protocol, calling it citizen. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So we sort of have a set of like um, wrapping protocols that I'm using here within the data. First, you have Hyper-B, which is the key value DB that we're building on top of. And then we have the um, like tabular DB, which is the system for uh, like having uh, schema definitions and layout. Yeah, it's kind of fun, citizen. And then from there we have the citizen, which is the so it's a schema definition protocol data layout. And then citizen is the actual schema definitions. So we, we have these kind of layering protocols involved here. So the header is actually the kind of tabular uh, uh, data stuff. And maybe we'll do it like this. We'll do yeah, we'll do self. And then the idea is actually to for um, <laughs> immigration mechanic. Well, you could call the moving between nodes that. We don't actually really need this header. So I'm not going to do the header, or at least not like this. Instead, let's talk about the table definitions. So there's table IDs, and those are going to be um, probably automatically generated. But we're going to have a schema, which is a URL string. And I think that's it for now. And so the tables, table definitions are really about mapping a schema URL to a shorter name, an ID. And in practice, it'll probably be something like tables, table one equals some JSON, and then table one, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't love, you know, table one, table two, table three, but, you know, it has to be sort of an automatically generated name it's about the indirection. I guess we could also do it like this, where it's tables, table ID, um, and then like uh, def, uh, schema, and that's the uh, URL string. And then uh, the rest of it is sort of self-defined. No, we'll do it like this. I gotta think about how the range, range reads work. Um, yeah, we're gonna do it like this. And 
and table ID will just be a number. So then our tables will look like, our data layout will look like this. So that's our, this is our sort of template. And so in, in practice, it'll look like, um, So that's how we'll do it. How's that feel? From gossip to citizen. Time minded. Um, this feels pretty good to me. The, the logic that we have to think about is when you're reading one of these databases, you'll need to, you'll be loading it up and the first thing you'll want to do is map, you know, you're, you'll know that you're looking for a table and you'll be wanting to look up the table by its schema. So our API will look something like, um, you know, uh, db.getTable. And then it'll, you'll be interacting with, you know, that API there. And so that'll do translate this request to this lookup, pull out the table ID, store that inside of the object that's being created here. And then any kind of requests will be getting translated to the correct table. So you're doing one lookup when first interacting with the database to map to the correct table ID. And then from there, as well as, you know, loading up the schema and, and um, definitions and then any interactions you'll be doing from there will be with the correct table against the schema definition and you know for cleanliness we're just gonna change that to ID so that's pretty straightforward I'm gonna take my font down now something a little easier for me and then I'm going to go to my base here now what are the commonalities here there's get table and we'll need to Normalize the URL. Well, actually, we're going to leave that to the users to get right. And so we'll need a table class that's going to get re re returned in that case. And what else here? A lot of APIs, a lot of methods on the actual table. The get table is gonna probably do a, it's gonna go through a process of first trying to load up the schema from either a cache if it has it, and then um, a uh, uh, fetch it from the live endpoint if needed. Yeah, I know citizen.com's taken. I'm, I'm, I haven't registered yet, and uh, you know, people like to have fun. I, I, so, when I made Beaker, one of my good friends, I was still working it on it as an early project, and one of my really good buds decided to be funny and registered beakerbrowser.com before I could get it. And um, one of the things that we always kind of joke about is whether or not 
to use React. And as you can, you know, you may have saw it earlier in the stream, I use Lit Element now, so I tend not to use React. So they put on at beakerbrowser.com something like a new database built on React, some nonsense like that. And, you know, it was funny and whatever, right? And it was, it was meant to, in good spirit, you know, in good fun, because, you know, once he, uh, <laughs> yeah, how much could it cost? It was meant in good fun because, you know, he, he then transferred it to me. So it was almost kind of like a gift, you know, paying the money to get it registered. Problem was that transferring the domain ended up being this huge pain. So anyway, I, I now get very paranoid about namespace registration, letting anybody know, like, what domain name I want to get prior to, to getting it. Uh, it's not that I don't trust y'all, but obviously based on how quickly I jumped on getting the citizen module name. Yeah, I don't totally trust y'all. Wouldn't blame you. It's always fun, but, you know. Yeah. So it won't be citizen.com. And if somebody here registers every other existing... I've, I searched earlier. There are a couple good ones. If you do that, that would be cold, but I'll live. You can always do, like, citizenproto.com or whatever. You gotta squat. You gotta get on it. Something else I gotta, yeah, so the schema bit, like I'm gonna need to have a way to like have debug schemas being served and you have to think about how to like when the schema gets fetched and like how the software reacts to schema upgrades. I think it's gonna have to trust that the people that maintain the schemas aren't going to break them um, and you know, or break backwards compatibility. And that'll be an interesting situation if that ever does happen. Interesting aspect about this design is that the schema definition can evolve without the node operator, the, the federated node operators necessarily being involved. Um, the citizen uh, instances, you know, federated uh, the servers, um, if they just kind of periodically update their schemas, they should be pretty generic about what they pass through um, when they accept writes from the client. And they'll validate against the schema as they fetch it. And so, uh, it's kind of easy to imagine putting extension points into those schemas and then the client side of the federated network could actually be you know, detached from the uh, uh, whatever front end the server is hosting and you know you can get some interesting sort of ability for um, development to be detached uh, from somewhat from the people running those nodes. ping here, so if you'll excuse me a moment. Alright, alright, alright. So I think like get table may be the only at this point top level thing and then we got the schema stuff now the schema that probably ought to be in its own file because we're going to maintain a cache and have logic for fetching them and things like that And then the table is going to take in the database and then it's schema object and then it's probably it's ID. And this is going to have all kinds of methods. It'll probably have an async get. And it's going to need, well, you know, it'd be interesting to think about what that table API ends up looking at, like. Could just be a sort of a pass through to Hyper-B, but you know, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Let's start with the schemas. So, one of this get function and we're going to have a cache yeah, let's do it as a net 
and you know the index for the naive simple way to do it without thinking about the TTLs on them or anything would be if it's there just return it Yeah, that's the end would have been great. CT dot Z in. All right, so let's think here. <clears throat> A couple of things come into play here. Got to start to think about how these schemas are defined. Oh boy. <coughs> um. While I'm dwelling on that, I'm going to grab myself another drink. So I will be right back. All right, fed the cat while I was at it. Okay. So we're gonna need a JSON schema parser, first of all, we know that. So let's go ahead and knock that out. We used AJV in the past, and I seem to recall it being pretty good. Seems fine to me, so we'll go with that. And so, some interesting questions about how these schemes will be defined. It comes down to like, first of all, how the key, uh, the value space works. Um, there's obviously defining. Uh, like, is it possible, for instance, that there are what you might consider subtables? You might, might well want subtables. An example of that might be, suppose tables one is posts, and you got uh, post one, and it's got a definition, but maybe it has a media embed, like an, an image or, or multiple images. In that case, you might want something like that. Now, you might not, though. In fact, now that I think about it, you probably definitely don't want that because when we're doing our key range scans, inside of a sub so here's an example we got three posts in here and one of them has an attachment if we're trying to scan out the list of the posts we don't also want to scan out the attachments which that would do so we actually want attachments to be in its own table It would look something like this. So 
then you're not scanning out data that you're not looking for. And it's actually pretty important. <clears throat> you definitely don't want to have it so that when you're reading, just trying to read posts, you have to read out bl binary blobs. So subtables sounds like a non-starter, which is actually good. That makes it easier for us. Another thing we have to think about is when a table does not have a JSON, it's not containing JSON, how to deal with that, which means we probably need to wrap the JSON schema in a wrapper object. So let's pull up an example JSON schema real quick. Close out some of these tabs. grabbing this example so that I have something to kind of refer to here. A little too big. We'll go with that. And um, the question is, how do we deal with any kind of metadata that might be involved here. Now, one way to do it would be, <laughs> I have never met anyone or anybody named JSON now. So, one way we could do this is <clears throat> sort of work within the format here, where if the values are not um, a JSON, but they're uh, uh, binary. We just do something like this. And that's what defines a, a table that include, that just has binary. That'd be pretty straightforward. So why don't we do it that way? Makes sense to me. So, over in our schema land here, we set the URL. We'll need an async load. And I'm probably going to use node fetch for that. Yeah. I got the real estate. It's going to take up. import fetch from node fetch and we'll just do this that definition equals await fetch this dot url and if this fails it is a disaster so we will here and that is a way to uh, sort of in debug mode or build mode you know developer mode not actually try to load from the real endpoint but load from a local host hosted endpoint <clears throat> um, so that I can actually have the correct you know make it pretend like it's fetching from that real destination but but not I'm going to do that in the code for now, just to make life easier. Uh, and 
we're going to do that by replacing I'm going to have to register that domain name sooner than later here, but we'll replace citizen.com and that'll become HTTP local host 3000 So we'll now need to add another endpoint. Which serves those schemas. And we'll go ahead and use this one sort of temporarily. Pass in to compile and you get a validate function. So we'll want a validate function. I'm guessing that could fail, which would be probably something that throws right there. So we'll do try this.validate equals, so we need to import AJV. AJV.compile. This that definition. If that fails, that's another bomb out. Okay. And that's pretty much it. So now we do let schema equals new schema URL. And then we do await schema, nope, schema.load, and that's that. Okay. We should call this fetch instead of get to reflect the network aspect of it. So from here, we're going to, in the uh, base sort of, um, we're going to, in get table, we're going to load the schema. And then we're going to new table this schema and something else we got to do which is look up the schema mapping so first we load the schema next we do let uh, table def equals await this dot b dot get nope this dot b dot sub tables dot get schema URL <clears throat> and we're going to 
dropped in to try catch. <coughs> if it fails, we have to create the new table. And now we're getting into a auto incrementing ID situation. <coughs> so let's do validation real quick. So if the table definition fails, in this case, we're actually just going to automatically, oh gosh, how do you deal with that? If the table definition is corrupted, that's a bad deal. That's just good old fashioned database corruption. <clears throat> and I think you got to, I think you got to bomb out if that happens. doesn't exist next thing we need to do is we need to read through the table uh, tables definitions let's load that hyper B API reference again is there a key stream or is it just read stream just read stream <clears throat> so we want to read out all the key uh, all the values in that table And uh, then so we're going to do what? Table dash equals await new promise resolve reject. So we're going to do this dot b dot create read stream <clears throat> in the tables namespace. We're gonna need some stream helpers here. We want, we want pumpify or pump? I think pump and then <clears throat> concat stream. Okay, that is not what I want. Autocomplete, stop doing that. Import pump from pump import <clears throat> concat from concat stream. If it fails, I'm pretty sure the only reason that would fail is that there's just no values under. Hmm. No, if it fails, I'm going to just let it bomb out in its own way there. <clears throat> Not going to handle that error. And then uh, I'm going to sort the table definitions. Uh, where. You know, we're going to have to look at uh, what this looks like. Because we want to basically sort by the key. I guess we can do it by a.key.locale compare b.key. And that should now g 
give us a answer about uh, highest key. It should now be I'm gonna reverse that, and it should now be the, the first item in the array. Table def zero dot key. <clears throat> So then we do that new, and we'll do highest ID. New ID equals that plus one. This is all we're having to go through to create an auto increment. Not great, but what can you do? And then we're gonna write the new entry, which is um, actually, And now we write it. Oh, wait, this dot b dot sub tables dot put at b table def dot id <clears throat> and the table. Uh, no, not table def dot id. We put it at the schema URL. And then that's that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm interested to see how much of this is correct. <laughs> so now, what we should be able to do is we'll go into our database loading bit here. And as a debug run, do a console.log public server db .get table. And we're going to do HTS citizen.com and I named it person.json. I am fascinated to find out what happens when I write, uh, write this zt.cn. Huh, that's not bad. It's not great, not bad. Oh, brother, I doubly defined fetch. All right, of course I did. We'll call that web fetch. As I recall, AJV is actually not, I have to actually create an AJV instance. So let's go back over here. Not a constructor. What is the usage here? I think it is. Import AJV from AJV. You're saying it's not a constructor, huh? Well, what is it then? If you're so smart. Bizarre. Let's see here. What does AJV export? TypeScript. Uh, all right. It is to a class. Do I have a double like definition of it somewhere?
the heck am I doing wrong? Um, I wouldn't say that I'm not a fan of TypeScript per se. Uh, it's more that I, um, I just like transpiling in general. It's just kind of mental overhead. Um, I just like bundling, but here we are. Um, and the, uh, For me, the, um, okay, that's broken. That sucks. That gonna work? No. Okay, well, whatever. Um, you can actually get a lot of the value of TypeScript out of using JS docs, because TypeScript actually can handle JS docs, and you could pass it into the TypeScript compiler. And that's how I like to use it personally. But, you know, it's just the compile stuff I don't go for. So, let's see here. We're getting some situation where I'm doing a console.log, and it's getting a promise, so there's some await that I'm missing. And I'm not even sure where that console.log is, which makes this... Oh, it's right here. So that's actually not such a problem. But that is a problem. We need the server running before we can load the schema. So our order of server creation is wrong. We have to actually set up the routes before we set up everything else. That kind of sucks. How much does that suck? It's going to depend on how everything ends up being constructed, but for now I'm going to assume it's not a problem and we'll deal with it when we deal with it. Um, so we'll set up the database after it's listening. Incorrect table definition. Uh, let's take a look real quick at our databases and see what all happened since we ran this code. So I'm going to do hype b ls on that. Okay, so nothing got written yet. I'm going to be so glad to have that the hyper b, <laughs> the hype cli to examine our data. Okay, so nothing got written. So it's giving incorrect table definition. And it says it's getting null. So that would be incorrect. So let's take a look at where we're fetching. Nope, don't want to run you again. I want to run you. So that seems right. Schemas person.json, localhost 3000. Let's make sure that URL is actually lo it's being served. And so to do that, I'm going to go to my database thing. I'm going to remove this debug bit so that my server can successfully load itself. And then I'm going to go over here and schemas person.json. Okay, so that's not serving correctly. Oh, there's an underscore, of course. So that is serving at uh, the underscore. But where did it try to load from? So it did seem to try to load from the correct place. Hmm. What's that about? All right, this is shameful, but I'm about to do, but I'm gonna wait for a second and see if somehow timing is factoring into this. Nope. Timing is not factoring in. So for some reason this fetch 
is getting null. It's not getting null. Incorrect table definition. Wait a minute, where's that error coming from? Incorrect table definition. That's coming from over here. I see. I see. Okay. I misunderstood what happens when you do a get on something that doesn't exist. Okay, so the schema loading is actually fine. So that was a rabbit hole in the wrong direction. It's actually over here that's failing, and the problem is that uh, table def can actually come out null if it, the value didn't exist. So that means we need to change our approach here. If this fails, then it's going to bomb out in its own way, and I don't know what a failure in that regard would look like. Now, if the table does exist and it fails validation, that's a bomb out. But if the table def is just not defined, then we do this. And I'm going to preemptively put some logs in here because I'm pretty sure I got this code wrong. So let's find out. In fact, I'm also going to avoid the mutation. Okay, so there's always that possibility. Should have thought about that. Uh, which is that there would be none. Seems to have worked. Now if I do that hyper BLS, interesting. Oh yeah, I defined it this way. Yep. Boom. Yikes, what is this about? I mean, get stuck on an accessing network. What the heck, man? You having trouble reading the key space? Hmm. Well, that's not helpful. We'll have to use some code to answer this question for ourselves. So I want to take a look at what we just got out, what just got written. Hmm. Wonder why, um, so the, the, that's correct. So for some reason, the hyper B, the, the hyper hype command line is, is failing. That's a shame. I'm going to have to do some debugging on that. Okay. But it worked. So now the interesting question is to see what happens when another schema gets involved. I'm going to call this person2. And it's just for debugging. Let's see if our auto increment code works correctly. So first, let's see what it gets us.
failed to compile a schema definition at person 2. Ah, it's the ID. Okay. As expected, I got some of that code wrong. I was sorting by key, but I actually need to sort by value.id, and it's actually not going to be a string, it's going to be a number. Let's try it again. Now it's working. So now if I go ahead and get rid of my debugging code and run it again, we should now have two tables. Great. That's pretty cool. Feels nice to, the big ball of hair is shrinking. That's nice. Uh, so now, we can start to define the table class. It's going to have get, it's going to have put, it's also going to have uh, create read stream. I have delete. And let's mimic the Hyper-B API closely on this. So where is that at? Right here. Del. And let's see. So you got this dot db, but you actually want this dot. B to be this dot db dot b dot sub tables dot sub id and the naive version of this would be this dot b dot get the key you know just passing through all these And the reason we're wrapping this is that we are going to add the validation on top. Each of these are still to do's. And because uh, the server node won't have control over the hyperbees, um, in terms of uh, every write, we actually have to do the validation both on read and on write. We'll start with doing it on write. It's a pretty obvious one. And we'll do, uh, let's take a look at our AJV. All right, you get valid. All right. That's valid equals this dot schema dot validate value. If not valid, you throw validate.errors and we're just going to throw the, the first one. Okay, so now if we go over to our debug code, and we do await people table dot put, take a look at our schema. It expects a first name string and a last name string and an age. None of them are required.
So let's just try a, a series of puts here with a couple of variations. So those should all pass. This next one should fail. And I'm gonna not have it be a throw, but just log. Let's take a look and see what we got. Okay, let's see here. That's in line 69 of base. Of course, nice. So the first argument. Is there a problem with doing sub dot sub, or is there something wrong with the ID? The idea is not there. How did that happen? That's how. We're getting confusion. So the Hyper-B returns not just the direct value when you do get, it returns a wrapper object of a key sequence number, which is an internal detail, and then the uh, a value object. So we actually need this to mimic that, which would be key of the schema URL. We'll just leave sequence undefined. And then over here, it needs to be table.value.id. OK, so I'm not happy with that. So now, why is it looking for? Maybe it needs to be a string. Let's take a look at this code right here. Index 430. So I'm a little surprised to see that error throwing. So let's see why it's trying to do a buffer dot from on what I'm passing in. Line 430. This could be a bug in Hyper-B. Let's try doing, um, a, a string value there. Yeah, this may be a bug. I actually type number. That shouldn't be right. It was in uh, line 31 of DB index. I wonder if Hyper-B has a bug. It's not able to do sub subs of subs. Well, there's only one good way to find out. I'm going to go to work. I have Hyper-B cloned. I do. Let's pull the latest. And, and I'm going to put in a test case and see if this is a Hyper-B bug.
No, they got a test for it. Now they're using their own separator, not the null one. So why don't I I think the accurate way to do that would be just to do default params. And let's run the test. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it looks like Hyper-B is okay. So let's take a look at the code that's actually throwing here and see if we could figure out uh, what piece it is, because we're, we are getting a stack dump here. And so we should just take a look at, uh, we should dump out some of the parameters that are going in, maybe they'll illuminate what's going on. So line 442 of hyperb index.js, and that is right here. So let's take a look, console.log key. What is it trying to encode and failing to do so? It's failing to encode that, it looks like. Now, now it's saying line 430. Let's try that and see what we get. Seems like it dislikes that number. It's expecting an instance of buffer, array, buffer, array, or an array-like object receive type number. That's what it doesn't like, it's that number. But why does it like strings okay? Interesting. So something's inconsistent here because turning it into a string does fix it, but it's throwing somewhere else now. It's throwing at 444, which is a number again. And why is it a number again? Ah, because I'm putting at a number. So it looks like Hyper-B does seem to bug out on numeric key values. So that's a thing. It's a shame. Probably fix it, but. I'm just gonna always need to coerce that. Okay, well, got around that bug, so that's good. Probably ought to file that in the Hyper-B repo. But now it's saying validate is not defined, so let's find out why validate is not defined. Because that should have been defined right around here. Let's take a look at what this dot schema looks like. Try it again. Can't read property zero of undefined. That's at line 82. Yeah, brother. Okay. So our validation is working. I think that's your first uh, message, Sophia, so welcome to the stream.
feel free to chat with us and hang with us. So let's wrap. This ought to have a little more than just, uh, should at least be an error type. So, Perfect. It's even gotten the message right. That's handy. This is pretty cool. We're loading the schema definition from an endpoint and applying it to our database. It's a pretty neat idea. So now we need to apply that kind of validation across the board here. So uh, let's get that going. And this one, interesting question about whether or not we ought to throw or not. I suppose that would be a parameter. For now, we'll, we will. Hmm. hmm. Well, what you don't want to have happen is a single bad entry cause the whole read stream to fail. You really want it to either i mean you certainly could you could have a you know be kind of strict like that or you could have it um uh sort of just drop invalid values or replace the invalid value with a um uh some kind of wrapper object explaining that validation failed Tough to say. It's going to depend on like what kind of what the context is. If we just you know drop the value, that's the simplest thing to do. Uh, but then um, you know you'll have a situation where like, hey, my post isn't showing up. Why not? Um, but I kind of think that's still the best solution because unless you're debugging, and you know if you. We can add a parameter in here later to have different behaviors, but I'm going to do it this way. So we'll do a th uh, pipe through the stream here and. Um, we're going to, actually, I'm not going to do pump. I'm going to do pipe. And on each object, we're going to do uh, 
const valid equals this dot schema dot validate on the object dot value and we'll call it object and call it entry for consistency. And if valid this dot push the entry. And if not, it won't get pushed. And that should be that. So let's see here. So now to get our test data here, we need to disable the validation on puts real quick. Uh, so we're going to do that. And we're going to let have a let's run. And then we're going to test by doing console.log get first on one. That should throw a validation error. And same with, well, it shouldn't. Yeah, that'll throw a validation error and then create read stream uh, is a different story. You need to form this differently. But it should just give us an empty array. And let's see what we get. Okay, we got some errors. So we got the coercion problem again. Thought I hit all of those, but I clearly did not. Okay, validation through just as expected. That's great. And then I've got some kind of problem bug here where R is not defined. What do you mean R is not defined? What line is that happening? Line 56. Need to wrap this in parentheses. I can't do requires inside of ES modules. It's so handy, but I can't. Okay, empty, empty array as expected. And if I run this again and remove the invalid writes, which actually if I just add, re-add validation, then invalid data won't get written anymore. Okay, but that's wrong because I need to not use the arrow notation. Okay, and then we got that problem, great. Okay, good. So it looks like our whole table system is in place with the schema validation and everything. So that's pretty, pretty exciting. So uh, the next thing to do, I suppose, would be on the different databases to during setup, create the tables. Tables for the win. If anybody's coming in recently, this is kind of what that looks like. It's all on a key value database, which is kind of like level DB. We have this whole system of 
having the tables being defined by JSON schemas, which are loaded from a URL, and then defined by that URL, we look up the table by its schema, pick out an ID, and then we start working in that subspace, and the validation is applied automatically. We haven't done the binary version of uh, you know tables that contain binary. We'll get to that later. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So yeah, like I suppose the next thing to do would be to have the different de uh, databases um, have a function for loading their tables and setting them. So you know, they set their schemas and load in. But you know what? It is 10.50 p.m. here, and we've been streaming for how long? Uh, let's see. Since 6.30? Yeah, it's a long stream. <laughs> um, and we've managed to keep at least, like, seven people for the whole time, which is pretty cool. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there for now and kind of uh, say that's a close on this stream but we got a lot done here which is pretty exciting and you know we're not gonna finish without committing so let's do that <laughs> it's nice of you to say Bushnelli but we'll get there one day at a time Add tables. Don't need to get more fancy than that. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking I'm just going to, um, anytime I'm working on this thing, I'm going to stream it. Because um, why not? It's kind of fun to do. It uh, doesn't seem to be screwing with my workflow that heavily. So, uh, if, as long as this is interesting, join in any time and I'll announce it on uh, Twitter and stuff. But, you know, subscribing on YouTube might be you know, also useful if you're wanting to make sure you don't miss it because you know how Twitter's algorithm is. It does not do things uh, chronologically. Um, so let's see here. Let's kind of review where we're at. We have a lot done. We've got the sort of the foundational layer for uh, both the kind of the server, um, the, you know, the HTTP server endpoints and it's uh, views. We got the front end assets more or less getting served and there'll be work to do there, but that's happening and build steps happening, everything. We have a simple WebSocket API uh, spec'd out so that you can communicate with the back end. And we have the base layer of the databases and the table system handled. That's a lot done. That's pretty good for a single stream. And um, so from the next steps, it's going to be about specking out probably the schemas that we're going to be putting in place and then um, starting to implement those tables and then probably beginning on the web uh, the RPC APIs to interact with those data sets. We'll get the user databases going as well. And then from there it'll be about um, setting up the, uh, I guess, really starting to set up the front end flows and having it start to talk to the server. And we'll get into all the exceedingly fun processes of doing things like registering a new account and getting all the stuff done. So maybe in the next stream, I feel like by the end of it, we could certainly ha get all the way to the point that we have, yeah, I bet we can get all the way to the point that we have at least the RPC APIs for a lot of the basic needs here. The thing I'm dreading a lot is the sign up flow, which is gonna require using email. <laughs> but I've done it before, so I can deal with it. I can live with it. Um, could always do some kind of SSO solution. It's not a bad idea. I know people have mixed feelings about it, but I'm always happier when I can just say sign in with Google. Um, so maybe we'll do that, but I don't know. It's probably good to start with email first. And, uh, yeah, so maybe by the end of next stream, which I might do tomorrow. I might just kind of keep going on this. This is my main thing right now. Uh, hopefully by the end of the next one, we'll have the, all of our RPC APIs done, all of our sort of back-end basics handled, 
um, and at least be able to kind of, uh, you know, probably have some kind of manual way to create users and start to see some of the pieces fall into place in terms of the application. So a lot of uh, yak shaving and uh, uh, laying the foundation with this stream. Uh, but the following stream should start to get pretty interesting. So thank you all so much for joining me. Um, as always, you can uh, find me on uh, Twitter, um, at pfrazy. We have a website for the technology we work with, the Hypercore Protocol, which you can find. I'll put the link in the chat here. There's a link to our Discord in, in at the website, so if you want to join us in the Discord, please do. And... Um, I think that about wraps it up. So enjoy the rest of your evening uh, and uh, catch you on the next stream. Have a good one.